So just to say hello again, my name is Sebastian Crutch, and I'm a psychologist here. Um, and as the keen-eyed ones amongst you who unfortunately don't have difficulty with reading will notice that I'm not Keir Young, which <laughs> it says on the screen at the moment. And that's because Keir, who many of you will know, who runs, uh, does a lot of the research, and I'll be describing later on, and sadly is busy doing experiments with um, some participants at one of the labs we use called Pamela in North London. But I'll talk to you a little bit more about that later on. But he's, he's, he's with us in spirit, he sends his best, best wishes, and it's thanks to all that many, many of you have done towards uh, the research program here at UCL. Um, just before I started talking about this project that we've been doing, and, and just to tell you a little bit more about the symptoms of PCA and what we're trying to, what we're trying to do about them, I just wanted to mention one thing which Bill, uh, Jill touched on briefly earlier, which is this new relationship with the Royal College of Optometrists, um, which um, Tim Shakespeare has been instrumental in leading. Um, there's a delightful gentleman there who's their director of research called Michael Bowen, um, and he recently held something called the Dementia and Vision Summit, um, because they've done a big project in which they had uh, gone around care homes and supported living accommodation, looking not at PCA, but about looking at individuals who had a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease and checking what their eyesight was like. So looking at not just the brain, but the eyes in particular. Um, and we, we held this, as a result of that project, we held this fantastic co um, uh, conference bringing together psychologists, neurologists, optometrists, ophthalmologists, people from vision science charities, people from the Alzheimer's Society. It's just really encouraging, and I wanted to encourage you, that for years we've been talking in this group about, oh, wouldn't it have been good if my high street optician or whoever it was had identified the thing that I had, not as being something that required a new pair of glasses, but as a as a brain site problem, not an eyesight problem. And I think there's a real move towards that, and we're talking with them at the moment about we used to have ideas about, well, we should print out flyers and go into all of our high street subscriptions, which relies on them, A, reading them, and B, remembering it, and then eventually, if they see someone with PCA, connecting the two. Rather more fundamentally what we're aiming to do is uh, something a bit more um, uh, significant, which I hope is to put a module of training about uh, PCA and visual problems in Alzheimer's disease more generally into the training program <laughs> of people, all optometrists and opticians. Um, it's something we're at the early stages of, but I just wanted to encourage you, for those of you who've been asking us to make, build links in that direction for years, that we are, we are trying, we think we've found a great partner now, uh, someone who seems equally passionate about it, coming from a different field, and um, so hopefully that's something that will make real progress and hopefully make a real difference, sadly not for the people here, but hopefully for the generation of people who, can, who, are, who perhaps are in the early stages of PCA and don't know. Um, so, uh, here's the title was Seeing What They See, and that's the name of a project that we've been running uh, jointly between here at UCL, uh, some fantastic colleagues at Brunel University, and we've got Mary Pat and Rachel here, who I hope will be able to draw up um, later on to talk to you, and some other various other colleagues and institutions. But really, this was an effort to try and take some of the um, experiences that people in this group have described to us and some of the findings that we've gleaned from our neuropsychological research, so our kind of paper and pencil testing of different visual and other cognitive problems, and to try and turn it into something useful. Um, to, because we've noticed for a long time that there sometimes was a discrepancy between how people uh, managed on our, some of our paper and pencil tests and the things that they did or did not find difficult in everyday life. So what I thought I would do briefly, if it's okay, um, is to describe to you, uh, with the help of a few videos, um, a few of the um, primary symptoms in PCA. This is, I guess, particularly directed at the people perhaps who are here for the first time. Um, and then to tell you a little bit about a couple of experiments we're trying to run to devise, a, devise aids and gadgets, and Mary Pat will talk about some of the strategies and conversations that she's been having and discussing with people with PCA and their partners, um, to which we're trying to understand better the impact of visual problems on everyday life, both the things you can do, but also your quality of life in the sense of yourself. <coughs> um, but also working with some engineers to try and design gadgets that you might be able to put around your house to help you, for example, navigate from room to room or find objects more easily. These are not things that are going to cure PCA, these are things that, whilst we're waiting for a treatment, we hope will make life just a little bit easier. 
So the usual apology goes to people who have difficulty with reading or, or seeing things up on this screen. Um, I'm going to skip through a few of these um, slides, but I'll try and explain, read them out loud or, or explain what's going on on the screen for those of you who can't see it clearly. Um, so what we've argued to the funders of this project is essentially that um, visual problems in dementia is not just about PCA, it's not just that there's this relatively rare condition, but actually that vision impairment is something that the vast majority of people with typical out memory led Alzheimer's will um, experience at some point in their condition. But what people with PCA kindly do in describing their difficulties is to give us an insight into the problems that those people with um, typical AD may have much later in their condition at a point when they can't tell you about it or remember what's happened to them. So a powerful window on the more general issue of visual impairment, brain sight loss in dementia. And so we wanted to work and create some, some visual aids uh, or interventions which could be used as in the home or a care home, not to cure the visual problem, but to help people cope with it better. We wanted to see whether that had an impact on people's quality of life. If you can navigate around your home better or locate things more easily, does that help you to live better with your condition? And as I mentioned, we wanted to listen very much to the examples of people with PCA and see what they can tell us about visual loss and Alzheimer's disease more generally. And broadly speaking, what we're trying to do is three different types of study. Um, I'll describe the first two and then I'll ask Mary Pat to come up and say a little bit about the third. But the first one is using traditional techniques, so paper and pencil tests, and also things like eye tracking, which some of you here will have helped with which is where you have cameras which can tell exactly where someone's looking. They wear a kind of headband with two cameras pointing at the eyes. And it enables us to see exactly what someone is perceiving or which part of the picture someone's looking at. And the reason this is helpful for us is, is that it helps us not it helps us to predict what kind or test out what kind of, for example, decoration within a home might be useful. So if I just click on the next picture. One of the PCA support group members here a while ago described that her husband was having great difficulty in using the toilet on his And she clicked a very intelligent lady that it was part of one of the possible reasons for this. In their bathroom, it was like most of our bathrooms, it's a white toilet with white walls and a white sink, and probably a light colored line and maybe even light colored tiles on the floor. And you just couldn't tell, you couldn't see which bit of white you should be sitting on. They might sit on the sink or try and wash his hands in the loo or just get confused and not be able to sit on So she took the slightly radical step of painting the entire room red. The toilet seat and the sink, which were white, stood out really nicely. There was a real contrast between the thing he was looking for and what was. And that's what's shown on the picture on the screen at the moment. So I have uh, four pictures. If you just look at the bottom two, computer-generated images. So we've got someone who works uh, in works for in architects and builders and designers. In short, you know, when you see those pictures of what your house will look like when it's built, he's one of those kind of people. And so he can create pictures of different types of decor where everything is kept the same except how you decorated the room. So the one on the left, I'm showing a picture of a bathroom in which most things are white and there are white tiles on the wall. And on the right is exactly the same bathroom fittings, but now all the paint has been turned red. And so this gives us a chance to test out, because not the same, the same thing doesn't work for everybody, it gives us a chance to test out uh, ahead of time whether, for example, a changing a change of decor might be the thing which helps someone to see and locate objects and use parts of their house uh, more clearly. Or it might be, for some people, colour might not be the thing. It might not be colour, it might be motion or lighting or some other key, but this gives us a way of testing out before you go to the trouble of changing your house around, but this is something that's likely to help you. Just one other thing I wanted to say before I move on is I showed you um, on this screen, up in the top right hand corner, there's a picture of someone wearing this eye tracking um, headgear that I talked about with these little cameras that tell where your eyes are. And we were just talking about this on my table before lunch, someone uh, several people were saying they've had the experience of things that seem to move when they're still. Has anybody else had that? So I remember hearing you um, talk about why I was doing a psychology test with a lady who was looking at a test where you show some dots on a page and you say, how many dots are there? 
the lady quite reasonably said to me, well, it's really difficult to tell when they're all moving. And she wasn't moving, the table wasn't moving, the book wasn't moving. What we found out by using these eye tracking cameras is what was happening was her eyes were moving in a tiny, imperceptible way. Looking at her, you couldn't see the moon, it looked like her eyes were still. But in PCA, in terms now that I read and quite a book study on this, actually about 80% of people with PCA have some change in the control, ability to control their eyes. And that doesn't mean you can't sort of look up and down, but as in subtle abnormalities that we wouldn't otherwise notice, but which we think are behind this experience of looking at something which is actually still and seeing the moon, because your eyes are jiggling, and, and the brain is missing its action, that is that the thing is moving. So that's just one example. The second type of experiment, and this is where Kier is today, um, Move on to this. Is this amazing lab called Pamela? I know there are a couple of people here who uh, very kindly signed up to help us with some of these tests. So this Pamela, I think it stands for the Pedestrian Accessibility and Movement in the Environment Laboratory. It doesn't matter. Essentially, it's a big warehouse, almost like a theatre set, where you can create spaces that people can walk and move around. So they've used it in the past for experiments, for example, for Transport for London. They set up a whole tube, tube train carriage and then test how people move on and off the train onto the platform. We're not doing that. Uh, we are trying to create rooms and spaces and testing whether different types of lighting condition, visual aids or cues can help people with PCA, people with typical Alzheimer's disease, and healthy control um, participants who don't have either of those problems to move through these spaces in a more efficient and relaxing and confident way. So the picture that's on the screen at the moment um, is a little bit difficult to see, but um, it shows these boards that we set up to kind of create corridors that people can navigate around, and also the different light, lighting conditions that we're able to use. And this is another uh, picture of a slightly different test where someone made a visual cue, which is just a rotating uh, light spot. So this is an example of taking the, the story of that gentleman who can play badminton, who can see moving things but not still things, and seeing whether it helps people to locate certain places in space. So I'm just going to play the video. For those of you who can't see it, all we're looking at is essentially a blank room with a door on the far side, and the person has simply been asked to just walk through the door. So they've got to navigate around the table, walk across the room and through a door. And on the door is a little light which rotates around to give some sense of motion and movement. You can track exactly what they're looking at. So for example, it gives us the opportunity, if we, if we come up with a really successful cue, some sort of visual property that enables people to use their residual visual skills to help them to see where something is, the next to see whether people are looking at that and which other bits of the environment are either helpful or distracting to. And essentially, what this is trying to do is we'd love to be able to, for example, <coughs> create cues that might, for example, help you find a way to the bathroom and, and do more easily. Or ideally, that, you know, that like lots of people have said, well, I can get to the bathroom door, but then I can't see where the hand is. And we're doing some other tests at the moment, we can spend cues running this afternoon. If we can create mats, for example, so that if you want to leave some, a drink out or something that someone particularly needs, then you can place this on one of these mats, which is much more visible and much more easy to find. Because it, it, it's our experience in this area that lots of people talk about assisted technologies and actually find that they are not assisted at all, they're lacking. I remember someone saying that one of their very polite, kind, caring friends had heard that she had difficulty locating the light switch on the wall. She said, oh, that's easy. And they get these remote controls, which is easy. Yeah. You can be sat in your chair. You can turn the lights off without even having to get up, which is great, provided you can find the remote control. Because as soon as you put it down, it just extends and exacerbates the problem. So what we really need to do is find things which are practical, and useful, and cheap, and that you can buy them and try them out. If they don't work for you, you haven't broken them, broken them out. These are not going to be multi-thousand pound systems, which requires a totally uproot the way you live. Um, and indeed, there's a big debate about, for example, the example of um, colouring your bathroom red. A lot of people don't want to paint their bathroom red, and that's fine. And there's this balance to be reached between things which might be useful versus changes that we would all feel uncomfortable making to the, this precious place where we live. Now, 
I'm going to be quiet for a moment, and I just wanted to show you um, another slide to just help Mary Pat describe a little bit. Just watch this out. If anyone's got any questions about these uh, Pamela experiments, then I'd be very happy to ask them, provided you're not one of the people who's going to help with the experiments next week. I'm not getting out. <laughs> Thanks, Sebastian. Um, thanks very much for giving me an opportunity to share a little bit about what my um, section of the study is looking at. And I know some people in the room because I've had the pleasure of coming to meet you in your home to look at um, how you're managing the environment within your own home. And so this is uh, preparatory study three. Um, my colleagues and I are meeting with people with PCA and their family carers to find out at home how you're managing the physical environment and to glean information from you about the strategies you've used without any advice from anybody, but that you've picked up over time uh, given your experience um, living in the home and managing someone who's having some problems and using that knowledge um, to inform how we may help other people as well as learning from people uh, about how not only are you managing the physical environment and making changes within the environment to help cope with the, um, with the, with the disease, but how other, uh, other issues such as in your social environment you're also coping with at the same time. So not only are you negotiating how to manage day-to-day um, -day activities around uh, feeding and dressing and toileting and bathing and so forth, but at the same time just managing family, managing relationships, managing changes in employment, um, managing changes in relationships with friends and others at the same time. So if we're going to help you in terms of managing the environment, how might we best do that understanding that you're managing all kinds of other things at the same time too. So how can these changes help minimize the stress in people's lives as they're providing care or managing with these visual and perceptual problems, but managing all the other things we're dealing with in day-to-day -day life that go along with it. At the same time, we're spending some time speaking to professionals in the community, people who are, are helping um, individuals at home and, uh, and getting advice from their practical professional experience about some of the things they've done to work with people who are managing the environment, as well as um, getting to understand what they know in relation to PCA in particular. So when we go out to speak to primarily um, occupational therapists and some of uh, the dementia advisors or admiral nurses who are working with people with dementia, how much do they understand about PCA in particular versus um, uh, understanding dementia only in relation to memory? And so if we can find out what they know and what they don't know, then we can think about educational packages not, no different than what Sebastian's doing with optometrists. How can we also educate other professionals so they have a better understanding that PCA means much more than uh, just a, a memory problem that a lot of people assume that it's about. Um, so we're doing, uh, working with those individuals as well. So we'll bring all of that information together with Sebastian's work and our work and then hopefully um, come up with some strategies working with individuals who have the disease, carers, as well as professionals who are helping uh, to support individuals as well. Thanks very much. That's great. In the last couple of moments, uh, I won't go off too long, I just wanted to mention one other thing, um, which again, particularly kids and working on, uh, which is about reading. So, so many people um, in this group and others have been describing how reading is something which was one of the earliest difficulties that they noticed, um, but also that it's uh, a real source of frustration and loss of independence that they're not able to read. And what they want. One of the things we wanted to look at was can we take what we know from other experiments about different aspects of the visual problems in PCA and create a reading aid that somehow addresses, doesn't, again, doesn't cure PCA, but adapts reading into a way that is easier for people with PCA. I'm going to try and play a sound while I'm just, but I'm not sure it's going to work. 
Okay. And of course, it there, I think it's a uh, two part for most people to hear, but essentially, what, what was being read was somebody who is having difficulty finding their way around the page. So, individual words were fine, but the lady reading got interrupted in a sort of flow of what the meaning of the words were because her eyes would sometimes, for example, not flip from the end of one line to the beginning of the next, but go somewhere else in the passage, causing a difficulty to follow um, what the message was. And again, I'm putting up something on the screen which some, some will be able to see, some will not. This is, um, the, this is using these cameras which uh, can see where people are looking again. The very, at the very top, I'll try and describe it words. At the very top, there's a paragraph of text. And this is something that typically asks me. Don't that to me. It's someone with typical Alzheimer's disease reading it. And what you see, that there are some thin blue lines showing a very nice smooth movement from one line to the next. There are no problems. There. Every word is read in, in, in the order in the sequence it was meant to see. In the second section, there's someone with mild PCA who sometimes can read from one word to the next. But then there are some um, big, thick red lines marked in which show that sometimes they get so far in a passage and then they either have to go back because they've misread a word or because they're trying to go from the end of one line to the beginning of the next and they've moved to the, their eyes move to the wrong place. And a third example is someone um, with a more pronounced reading problem where really the words that they're producing are almost sporadically around the page. There's no ability to continue to read across the line in a, in a sort of orderly fashion. And the frustrating thing is all three of these people can understand perfectly well. This is very much a visual, visually based problem. So what um, Keir has done is to create a visual aid, I've got a video here which is going to help it to work, which tries to address some of those problems. So rather than expecting the eyes to move to where the words are, this is a technique in which you ask, you're shown a box on the screen, so you just keep your eyes still, and the words come to you. And then move in from the side so that you've got a bit of motion cue, in case you're one of these people, like a badminton gentleman, who can use motion to locate things. They're presented one at a time, so that the letters and other words around as you would normally see in, in normal text, words are surrounded by other words. Here, that's all stripped away, and you've just got a nice clear background and just the word of interest. And it comes in one by one with the rest of it, um, the visual um, problems in PTO, which this uh, aid addresses. I'll try and just play it just to give you a, an impression of how it looks. So you just see heavy snow has fallen across large parts of the UK. So it may not seem that obvious to some of you, but here, what he did was he got people, 15 people, to read passages in the, in the normal way you see them presented in a newspaper or in a book, so line after line after line. And these bars that are on the screen at the moment um, range from about 25% correct up to about 100% correct. So this is all people with PCA, so this shows that Reading problems are variable. Some people have real difficulty with reading, for other people it's not such a big issue. But what comes up next is the bars of how well people read once they put the same text, the same stories, through this box system of kids. And just obviously to highlight the example, but the first person on this um, show, whose results are shown on the screen on the left hand side, when they're reading the words in a standard paragraph presentation, they only got 25%, only a quarter of the words were read correctly. When they were shown one word at a time using Keir's system, they got about 90% correct. So that's quite, by any standards of the scientific experiment, that's quite a big jump. And of course, what this, do this doesn't mean that PCA has been cured. It doesn't even mean that the reading system is better. What it means is that we've adapted the process of reading to help someone with PCA based on the difficulties that people here have experienced and our previous experiments about what are the exact, type, the exact types of vision are impaired in PCA. And this is something now that we're working into an app so that rather than just reading um, uh, a set, set of paragraphs that we give you, that people, because they want to read different things, will be able to source from the internet if you're into literature, if you're into it, that you want to read in sports news. If you want to read a scientific journal, it can source, it can grab the text and convert it into this one word by word format. So that at least for a while, maybe for a year or two, 
and independence of reading can be restored or preserved over that level of that. So that's the kind of um, tool that we're aiming to try and produce. It doesn't solve every problem, but bit by bit, trying to turn the information that we glean from experience and conversations with you into things which are actually help on a day to day basis. Um, so I'm going to leave it there. I'm very happy to answer questions specifically about um, this talk or much more generally about anything to do with PCA and Alzheimer's disease. I'm also aware that it's two o'clock, and I think that's when we said the official meeting end is going to be. So if some of you have to go, we won't be offended at all if you've got trains to catch or places to be. But if you want to stay around, please feel free to. I think it might help. It might require some adaptation because with reading music, it depends which instrument you play. If you read something, if you play something like the violin or the cello where you're just reading from a single stave, I imagine it, it might well be helpful. If you're trying to read piano music where you have to look across, yeah, you have to look across two staves where your eyes have to keep bouncing up and down to see all the left hand doing what the right hand doing, that might be more tricky because you're essentially trying to look at two things at the same time. And chords, exactly. Um, so I think it, I think for single line instruments, it might help. I think for more complex, where you've got to see the relationship between multiple different notes at the same time, I think it might be harder to, to help with that. Thank you. So, really question. so the question is about um, the speed of reading. So the plan is to make the app um, flexible so that people can move the words on when they're ready. Because some people read faster than others. Um, and so it will have two options. One is you can set the sort of average reading speed, but what you don't want is it to flick on too fast and to kind of get behind and feel rushed and put them there out. And so the idea is to have it so you just tap the screen and the color comes on. It's a really good question. So I think what this probably speaks to is the relationship between um, vision and insight, so the awareness of one's difficulties. So generally we describe PCA as a condition in which insight is, in the vast majority of people, very well preserved. So this is one of the many ways in which PCA is different to what most people think of as Alzheimer's disease, where they picture someone in their late 90s who's confused about where and when they are. And if he doesn't, isn't to what you say to them, how long do you have a memory problem? They say, memory problem, memory problem. <laughs> In people with PCA, they're all too painfully aware, in the vast majority of cases, of, the, of things which are difficult. We occasionally see exceptions to that rule, um, but the vast majority of people, I think, have to provide a very insightful description of what's easy and what's difficult. But of course, for all of us, the notion of insight into when you've seen something, if you, if you miss something, then of course, you know, almost by definition, you weren't aware of it. So, I mean, I occasionally will be looking, I'm terrible at looking for things around the house, but I will frequently be looking for things, and I have no conscious awareness that that object is present. And it's not until someone else draws my attention to it that I'm aware. So, things like the zip, it might be that that's not a case of not telling someone about the condition, but that she genuinely, whereas it's completely obvious to you and I that there's a zip on the dress, your, your system may genuinely not have perceived in any conscious way that, there was a, that a zip was one of the features of that particular piece of clothing. Um, so I think sometimes um, one has to be very careful about sort of saying, well, did someone deliberately not tell me about that, or was it they no, it's, it's, it's so difficult to know in different situations. But what we, from a sort of neuroscientific point of view, what we understand about vision when you, for example, look at a scene that you've not seen before, there are some, some of what, uh, you know, the determinants of where your eyes go. So if I show you a picture of a forest with a man with a castle in the middle, 99% of people will look at the castle first because that's the most distinctive, salient feature of it. And what we understand is that, and this happens over in, sort of in mill uh, the course of milliseconds, is there are some basic properties you know, colour, form, contrast, lines, orientations, etc. within the picture, which attract your eyes to certain places. 
But as soon as you start looking into those places, you form a sort of higher level idea, conscious awareness of what it is you're looking at, which you then explore, what you sort of test out. Well, I think it's a castle in the forest, am I right? By looking to other places and checking that you know, the, the trees are green and that there's not lots of plastic around or something. In PCA, what we understand is that there's a much more um, that have got much greater reliance on the impaired um, perception of basic abilities, so that people find it very difficult to achieve that high level sense of what it is they're looking at. Well, they see bits of the picture at a time, which, so they have to go through the extra, very demanding task of almost piecing together the different bits of the puzzle in order to get that coherent sense that you and I are kind of fortunate enough to just get them easy with. It. And so, in that sense, vision and awareness interact very much and influence one another. So if you've got the idea of what we're looking at, that will determine how we're looking at it. Thank you, that's a really helpful. I think a lot of people have, have used colour in different ways. I know it, um, here in one one person, it's difficult to get in that hands into the arms of, of jackets and so uh, their partner sewed on little coloured taps at the inside the jacket so they can kind of see where to put the hand towards. And so I think of, it's a great idea. This is one of the opportunities for sharing these kind of strategies and some things that, things that work and that are helpful. So thank you for sharing that. Okay. So spreading things out, so for example taking music from the A4 size to A3 size helps because it's spacing things out. So I think that's absolutely right. The one caveat to that is a lot of people have found uh, with reading, for example, that making things bigger helps because it spaces things out, but actually makes it harder to read the individual words. Because in PCA, completely counterintuitively, smaller things are easier to see than bigger things. <laughs> so I don't, I don't know if you've experienced that with anyone here. I mean, we've had people before who could describe having reading difficulties going off to the library, library to get a so-called easy-to-read book, with large, which is a large print book, actually find it much harder. So you're absolutely right, there's something called crowding, it means if there's lots of stuff around, it's much harder to see than if something is on its own. Um, but when you make things really big, unfortunately, sometimes it has the counter, counter effect. So the comments there are that if you present things individually, it's easier than if they're all crowded together. And there are some opticians have access to that kind of um, to be able to present things in that way. Um, and that's absolutely the message that we were giving at this visual dementia summit. And um, so the opticians and optometrists there is that if you use a standard what's called Snell and Acuity chart, you've probably all seen them. We have big letters at the top going down in rows to small letters at the bottom. People with PCA. Are, have a double whammy. Big letters are hard to perceive, so the, one, the only one that's on its own is big, so you can't see it because it's big. All the small ones, which are the right size for you, are crowded in a line and have other letters around. You can show them individually, or if you don't use letters, but for example, you use small shapes like ask people to just to say, is that a tiny square, a tiny circle, or a tiny triangle? And that's one at a time, that's much, much easier. And you get a much more realistic assessment of how good people are at seeing small things. So that's a really, I hope people have that question about remote controls. So I don't think there's been specific research on it, but I, can, I think I can try and tell you the reason why. We often talk about, and I'm guilty of this, we talk about vision a lot in PCA. And absolutely that's the, kind of the, usually, almost always the first thing to go, and the thing that people notice most. But I've talked about the difficulty seeing where things are, but in PCA, the parts of the brain which are affected don't just control the ability to see by your eyes where things are, but also to feel where things are, to imagine where things are when your eyes are closed. Um, so a space in the very most general sense of understanding the difference between left and right, up and down. And we've had people who, in this group, who have said things which indicate a profound spatial Sort of misunderstanding or loss. One lady who asked her daughter, Am I the right way up? And it has, that's much more than just a visual problem. And this is why the difference between eyesight loss and brain sight loss is so, brain sight loss is so much more complicated because 
in individuals with PCA. We know the bits that are very infected help with the bits that you need to see where the buttons are on the control. But you or I can close our eyes and still kind of know where the numbers are or dial a number on the telephone. Because we've got a mental image, we've got an imprint picture in our mind, which we can spatially navigate around, even if we're not actually looking at things. And that, that image as well, that implicit vision, that internal picture, is also affected by PCA. So that's why these things, which <laughs> I'm sorry to everyone who's got PCA, but it's so hard for us to put ourselves in the shoes uh, of you who have PCA to fully appreciate quite how agonizing and frustrating it must be, because this stuff is just, as you, I'm sure you remember, before you have PCA, this stuff is just so automatic. We just don't realize quite how many complex operations in our brain is performing to enable us to do the same, what seem like the simplicity task. The vision for PCA, I think there is a general, quite significant increase in public awareness of dementia. Things like the Prime Minister's Dementia Challenge, the G8, and our G7 summits, etc. But make that a lot more people come up to me and hear that I do something to do with dementia or Alzheimer's disease or PCA and say, oh yeah, I just heard that on the radio or I saw an article in the newspaper. But my concern is that at the moment the, the understanding is very shallow, as in people, lots of people, and if you can meet this with these people here, not, not unreasonably at all. For example, I don't know that, what the difference is between dementia and Alzheimer's disease. As in dementia is the syndrome, Alzheimer's disease is the disease causing it. And so complexities like PCA, an unusual form of Alzheimer's disease, are still kind of way off most people's radar. And I think, I do feel confident that gradually people will have a broadening understanding of the different types of dementia and the different ways that it can affect people. I think that more people, not everybody, not even the majority yet, I think, know that now that dementia is not just about memory, but still haven't fully grasped the implications. And I think that's where we all have a role to play. It sounds a bit trite perhaps, but I think having these kind of conversations, talking about friends or family, getting as many articles in the newspaper, and um, interviews on the radio, whatever it is, I think gradually, it takes ages, but it gradually seeps into the national consciousness, and the consciousness of doctors and trainees, and that's why we're so excited about doing work with optometrists, and the fact that we know that employees working with the occupational therapists, and every little bit, I think, helps. And so I, don't, I, can't, I can't give a data when PCA will be fully understood by most people, it may never happen, but I think a broader broadening of the understanding to ensure we're, we're on that pathway and that is proceeding. Okay, a very tricky question. So, in terms of the, 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 the disease level, we know that PCA is one of a number of progressive Genital conditions. We wish it wasn't, but the cold hard reality, which I think everyone in this room is, is aware of, is that this is a progressive condition, things spread that it gets worse. So the disease which starts at the back of the brain and affects vision first gradually encroaches on other more frontal parts of the brain, some of which are in, at the front of the brain are involved in regulating our behavior. So um, all of the decisions we implicitly make every day about I'm feeling cross with you, I'm not going to say anything. Those kind of filters that we have in place, the sort of social rules about how we should and shouldn't respond in certain situations, they can be affected by Alzheimer's disease. And so eventually we know that things like irritability and aggression can become can be seen more frequently as the disease goes on. So I think it is the disease. Um, I don't think it's all the disease, but I think it's, you know, as you say, everybody is different. Different people have different sort of tolerance levels, different levels of awareness that they find difficult. Um, and if you are keenly aware of the profound difficulties that you have, it was, this is a, in my opinion, a pretty reasonable reaction to that. It's about how we cope and care for those people. But I come back to the disease thing not because I think it's all about not because I don't think the personal approach and the individual differences are important, but because I just feel there's still this lag in all of us 
because the brain's in the way and we can't see the physical damage to it. Sometimes, particularly when we're tired or below ourselves, there can be too much of a risk of thinking, oh, well, that's them being difficult or them being aggressive. And actually, it might be either largely or entirely a consequence of the disease. Um, and so we keep coming back to this idea of be aware of the physical injury because it could well be underpinning at least some of the, the difficult and distressing behaviours that you're, you're experiencing. Um, yeah, I'm sure Mary Pat would be a better answer to that one in terms of frustration. Do you want to come to you or do you want to just say, keep the microphone away? No, I'm just, I think that's good. Okay, yeah. awesome. Do you want to do you want to Only I guess to perhaps add in that our emotional response to events is perhaps controlled um, somehow differently and separately. And so sometimes our emotional response we don't necessarily understand as the as the observer the emotional response that's going on inside somebody um, with a diagnosis of PCA or any of the other um, diagnoses that I work alongside. So I think to validate, I think, Seb's point to just add that to it. Um, and also, I guess, just to add in the business of trying to find perhaps meaningful activity or meaningful purpose, um, if that's at all possible. Um, for somebody in whom those behaviours are apparent. Just to clarify one thing I said, I, I think I'm not in any way trying to um, criticise one's emotional reaction to someone who is perhaps being aggressive or agitated or irritable. I suppose it's just the internal frustration that we used this example earlier on my table, that if you see someone walk down the street who's got a cast on their leg because the leg is broken, never ever would dream of telling them to walk faster because there's that immediate objective sign that that is injured, that there's something wrong. If we had an emotion limb or a uh, kind of behaviour arm that was visibly fractured, we would find it would be so much easier for us to be constantly more aware of, of the challenges that person was facing. And it's just so frustrating that it's kind of hidden away that it's we don't have a constant reminder. Very much so, dehydration. Very, very much so. So, yes, if you're dehydrated, then any kind of confusion or, or cognitive function will, will be comprehended, for sure. And I guess in terms of diet, one would argue just the usual in terms of a healthy healthy diet that we would all seek to um, sort of observe. With the, with the dehydration question there, I think, it comes very much the fact that people don't always recognise that they're thirsty. So the trigger, there's kind of different factors on there. Being motivated to know that you need a drink is one issue. Being able, once you know you need a drink, to go and make yourself a drink is another. And so I think um, as the family and friends of people with a diagnosis of PCA or any other of these diagnoses, it's very much trying to identify where the needs are from motivation right through to execution of the task. And it's very easy to put a drink in front of somebody if you don't realise you're thirsty and you can't see the glass. It's not really there. Thank you. Uh, Given time's moved on, um, Joe and I are always happy to answer questions individually afterwards, but uh, I think it's probably time for us to say a big thank you to all of you for coming. Um, it's difficult for me to explain quite what a privilege it is to have so many of you taking all the time and effort and trouble to come all the way into central London, which is not easy to first get to, particularly if you have PCA, and to come and take part in these conversations to support one another to help us with our research and just to share in what is I know a series of very difficult experiences. So um, I always end by thanking Jill, but I'd perhaps today I'd like to end by thanking you and getting you to thank each other um, for all the support you provide to us and to one another. And I wish you a safe journey home and any queries you can find Jill on. Thank you.